Welcome back to Ranger Survival and Fieldcraft. I'm Andrew. I want to have for you guys today is the Scout Course Review from the Pathfinder School. Stand by. Alright guys, so welcome back to the fight up here in the Midwest somewhere in an undisclosed location. But I wanted to get this video out as soon as possible for you guys so you guys could see my review while it was still fresh in my mind of the Scout course at the Pathfinder School in Ohio. Now what I want to do is discuss the items that I brought as part of the packing list and then maybe some items I wish I would have had or some things I would have traded out. I wouldn't go over my clothing, the clothing that I wore at the course because that's very important as you're going to see. And then we'll talk about some of the deliverables in the course, some of the things that you're going to make in the course, some of the the challenges that are going to be in the course to give you guys a better idea of what to expect in that course if you're so inclined to go to that course in the future. And then at the very end, I want to give you guys just a few tips and tricks maybe to make your experience at the course if you go that much more enjoyable and get you closer to that patch and get you closer to that successful completion of the course to get you that patch. Okay, so why don't we dive in to my gear and I'm going to show you guys what I took and then a few lessons learned and some things I wish I would have brought to the course. Stand by. Everything you see before you is what I took into the course on the required packing list. There are going to be a few things that I'm going to show you here in a few minutes that I was able to recreate at the course or things that I was allowed to take into the course uh, for the purposes of holding uh, as another container or different quarters or cutting items. But everything you see right here is what I took into the course. I have my clothing minus what I put on, my hoodie, my shimaga, my wool cap sitting right here, extra socks and gloves. I've got my cover material, my tarp, my wool blanket. I've got my main malice pack, containers, tools and cordage, compass, headlamp, I've got my combustion devices, hygiene kit down front, and then my notebook and pencils down front. All required items for the packing list, and you guys have seen that in an earlier video. Now, let's go over these items really quick in groups uh, by the five C's or so and talk about those items and then things I wish I would have had or things that happened in the course that kind of threw a wrench to my plan. Stand by. All right, guys, so I have all my clothing and my cover elements right here for you to see. Now, take note that the clothing, besides what I'm wearing, has not been washed. The reason being is I want you guys to see how dirty that clothing is to, uh, to kind of understand what kind of terrain you're going to be going through. It is very thick there. It is very thick terrain, very muddy terrain. Half of the uh, training time it was raining or at least wet. So you're going to get dirty, but I want you guys to see my clothing so you understand how dirty the terrain is and how tough the terrain is going to be. Now let's start with the boots. These are just Nike SFS boots. These are thin boots. They're not very warm, but I made up with that by having thicker socks. Now why I went with lighter boots is because they dry out. I know from obviously going to the course before, uh, the basic course, is that the terrain out there at the Pathfinder School is wet and it's swampy you're gonna get wet. I wanted to have thin boots that would dry out easily and then I could wear thicker socks to kind of make up for that insulation. And what I did was I had two pairs of socks, one I wore, one went in my rucksack, and then at nighttime I would take off my boots, take off my socks, dry them next to the fire, have my other socks that I would put on to kind of help keep me warm. And then in the morning I would just reverse that, put on my socks that were next to the fire that are all dried out now, put on my boots that are all dried out now, put my good socks back in my rucksack, and then I'm ready to continue movement and do more training. Okay, so that was my game plan going in. I saw guys at the course that had heavier, thicker boots and it kind of slowed them down. It was a little harder to move through the woods and those things stayed wet longer. They, were, they weren't as easy to dry out, okay? Now, my pants, I just had 5'11 tactical pants. You guys will see the mud on these. You're gonna get muddy out there. Uh, down by the uh, Beaver Creek, if you guys ever get down there, it is nothing but water and mud and thick, tall grass. And I think at one point I was walking about knee high in mud trying to get out of there, but you're going to get dirty. So the 5'11 pants, they're okay. A little bit thinner material. Again, I heat up a lot when I move, so I'm going to go with thinner material. And then I can kind of compensate at night to uh, get warm next to a fire with uh, my blanket and my shelter items. 
The 5'11 pants did really well. I still have cuts and stuff on my legs from all the thorn bushes and thickets out there, but they held up and I didn't have to repair them during the course, so that's a plus. I took gloves. Everybody take gloves. If you go to this course, just take gloves. You should have gloves no matter what to protect your hands. The last thing you need is a good cut or scrape on your hands that kind of prevents you from having full dexterity and use of your hands. I took just some basic mechanic gloves that covered my hands really well. They get wet but they dry out quickly too. So I took these to protect my hands and they did fairly well. Next I had a Sonoma flannel top. This thing is kind of medium material uh, for thickness but it got tore up out there and so next time I go for the advanced class I'm going to get something thicker as a shirt to wear on top. Underneath this I had a moisture wicking t-shirt that wicked the moisture away as I sweated during the day and then it would collect in this. This is cotton and polyester I believe 70-30 and the collected the moisture and then just evaporated cooling me off during the day and then by the end of the day I was usually pretty dry uh, with this but this thing got cut up it actually tore the sleeve up pretty good if you guys can see that it tore the sleeve up I'll get you a close-up here in a minute but it tore the sleeve up and then on the fly I had to sew my sleeve together while we're doing the land navigation course very quickly and then continue movement but luckily it worked out and I'll show you guys how to do that here in a minute but that's the covering item that I wore usually during the day at nighttime what I wore was this Carhartt hoodie um, being that it was November colder months I knew I wanted something to put on at night that was thick warm and dry and so I had this they let me keep it and I put it in my rucksack on top of my wool blanket and then kept that nice and dry so at night all I had to do was change out my moisture wicking t-shirt was already dry I could put this Carhartt on put my shemag around my neck and then my hat back on and I was good to go for the night along with changing out my socks let's take a look at the tarp and the blanket so we have our wool blanket right here this is an alpaca warehouse wool blanket it is a queen size I've had it for several years now and finally got to put it to the test out at the Pathfinder School and it worked very very well. Some of the shelter configurations you're going to be sleeping on the ground, some of them you're going to be sleeping up off the ground in a suspended shelter. The, the wool blanket works great with a leaf bed. Now the tarp, the tarp is where we have some issues, okay? Spend the money on a good tarp. I bought a cheap tarp because I was thinking that we're probably just going to do some basic lean-tos. No, I'm going to do suspended shelters. And in the middle of the night, one night, my buddy comes to me. We're in teams, and so my battle buddy comes to me. And I'm at the fire, on fire guard, and he says, Hey, the tarp split, and we're using my tarp as a hammock setup, of course. And he was trying to sleep. Apparently, at some point in the night, he was trying to move around, and the tarp just split on him and fell. And then we were both sleeping on the ground the rest of the night. But splurge on that tarp, okay? Get a good tarp. Now to give you guys an idea of the tarp, so we had the shelter split. Now, if you guys look right here, it split right down the length of one of the seams, just maybe an inch or two away, and it started at the corner up here. Let's see if I can straighten this out for you so you guys can see this. So it started up here at the seam and went all the way down a good couple of feet until it stopped near mid grommet on one of the lengths and then just kind of stopped right there. By that point, my buddy was already on his, on his fourth point of contact outside the shelter and then he came and got me. He did this sewing job really quick next to the fire as we changed out. I just got my wool blanket rolled up in a nice leaf bed and then went to sleep for my, my turn at sleep. But he fixed it with bank line and then sewed it all the way up as best he could and then we just used his tarp for all the other suspended shelters that we had to make so definitely definitely splurge on a good tarp 
and a good cover material for your shelter and don't do what I did and get just kind of a cheap canvas tarp that's water treated um, and water resistant because something like this could definitely happen if you get a nick in one of the seams it could tear right down the middle so definitely definitely get a good tarp all right let's let's talk about tools real quick now in the uh giant layout i forgot to include the buck saw blade but you guys may have seen it kind of sitting off screen to the uh, uh my right your left now these are the required tools to take in you had to have an axe of some sort you had to have a knife that met school specifications at least a minimum uh, four inch cutting surface 90 degree spine on the back 1095 high carbon steel and then full tang then we had to have some sort of multi-tool here i just have the leatherman surge that i've used for a while and then a little sheath to carry it in, and then the buck saw blade, minimum 21 inches. So I decided at the last minute to go ahead and go with a 21 inch buck saw blade, and that worked out splendidly, all right? I highly recommend sticking to just the 21 inches or whatever the school packing list says, stick to that. 21 inches is perfect. I was gonna go with the 30 inch. It meant I would have had to find longer materials, better materials, and that would have ate up a lot of time. So I'm glad I went with the 21 inch and it worked fine throughout the course. The ax I took, Grants Force Brooks, camp hatchet and I haven't cleaned this guy off yet I haven't sharpened any of these knives I have not cleaned anything I want you guys to see kind of the state your equipment will look and be in once you guys complete the course as you go through the course now you notice there's a lot of uh, action that this axe head has seen as part of the course I've used it as a hammer not only as an axe to take down trees but I use this thing a lot and the hatchet is the perfect size don't go anything bigger than a hatchet if you don't have to or if you're not comfortable with it highly recommend just doing a hatchet 18 inches or so uh, whatever it is for a camp hatchet and then just make sure you give it a good nice edge before you go into the course it worked perfect Next, I had the knife, the Mora Garberg knife worked perfectly for the course. Uh, there were guys there that had um, some newfangled knives and then some kind of high dollar items. And some of those knives did not hold up well. Some of them were brand new out of the box. Let me tell you, if you take a knife there that's brand new out of the box, it might do well and it might not do well. What I noticed is that guys that had knives that looked like they were brand new, they saw a lot more chipping on the blade and they saw a lot more of damage to the knife overall and it didn't just it didn't last long in the course because of the amount of abuse the knives were taking this knife my garberg i've had for a year or two now a couple of years maybe and i've used it a lot i've sharpened it the point has kind of rounded down a little bit because of the of the use i put this knife through but it worked perfectly and it's still still sharp it hasn't lost much of its edge. There were guys there that took new knives. I think one guy even broke the tip off of his knife because it was somewhat new and he was probably doing something stupid with it, like trying to pry, okay? But the more Garber worked. So my next tool was just the Leatherman Surge. I like this tool because I can get to a lot of the items outside with just a one-handed open. Again, I'm a right-hander and a normie, so I can uh, get to that. All those left-handed freaks out there. Just kidding. Um, but anyway, surge here. I switched out with a super tool, and I only used the pliers just to pull a few things, uh, whether it was cordage for lashing or a nail, whatever it was. A couple of times, I didn't really have to use the pliers that much. What I used the most was the small saw. I use that for uh, notches, for small limbs. The only issue I have with the Leatherman Surge is that there's a small locking device here. And as I swing it up, it, can, it all swings together. But sometimes that locking device can get stuck, as you guys will see right here. I can show you. And then if I keep going, it'll pull the blade out because the blade is simply sitting in there by a joint. And so that locking device, if it comes undone, the blade can slip out. That's just one thing I don't like about it. I wish the it wasn't interchangeable and the saw was actually attached like the knives and the scissors onto the surge just by the joint here, and it was just one tool. I'd rather have that than interchangeable parts, but it worked for me. It wasn't too bad. All right, guys, so those are the tools I took to the course. No issues. Okay, so let's talk about combustion really quick. Now, the things that are required in the course, 
flint and steel, some sort of flint and steel. Here I just have, I actually took the SE uh, bearing block slash uh, flint and steel, and then a piece of shirt that I've had for a little while. Into the course, and then the second thing is a lens. Now, got this five power lens right here from Self Reliance Outfitters. The other things I took into the course uh, that they let me keep one was the six inch ferro rod, so they let me keep the ferro rod in the course, but I never used it, never touched it. Uh, just kind of sat in my bag and it was there, but kind of glad I had it anyway. But it wouldn't have helped me too much because by the end of the course, everything we had was soaking wet anyway for fire starting material, but I had this and they let me keep it. Um, no issues there. The other thing I had that I'm glad I took that they let me keep was just a simple tobacco tin or craft tin like this. This one is uh, roughly, you know, three and a half inches by maybe two and a half and an inch thick or so. And we use this uh, to carry all of my items in here, minus my ferro rod, but I also had it for the purposes of keeping all of the char that I made in the course. This is all the char that I made in the course, and I just shoved it all in here and put it in here. We made it inside of our canteens, but I put it in here and wrapped tape around it to keep it safe during our final few movements to keep it dry so I could start that flint and steel fire, which is a no, which is a go, no go criteria at the end of the course. So these are the fire items that I took into the course. You guys can see not much here. Uh, if you were a smoker, they let you keep a Bic lighter to light your cigarettes. Um, but uh, that was obviously something that was controlled for all the fire tests and everything. And you've got all the graders around you anyway when you're doing this stuff. So there's really no point in trying to cheat or attempting to cheat using a lighter and it wouldn't be uh, real bushcraft and uh, survival anyway. But these are the items I took in for my fire components. Let's talk cordage and containers together really quick because obviously we use cordage for suspending containers and then we use a lot of different cordage in the course for lashings and bindings. The main piece of cordage you, that is required to bring is an entire roll of bank line. Here you got my entire roll a little bit off the sides, a little thinner uh, than when it started. Used it for a lot of lashings and bindings and different things for shelters, for camp craft, for bow drills, for everything. The other piece of cordage that was required was 20 feet of natural rope, which I have right here attached to my ladder style pack frame. You can see we use this as the shoulder straps for our pack frame. Now, other cordage that was not specified in the packing list, but I would highly encourage to bring if you go to the course, is going to be your quick deploy ridge line. Luckily, we were able to make quick deploy ridge lines very quickly, no pun intended. Uh, while we were at the course, they had a whole roll of 550 cord there for us to use because you're going to need it for your shelters and for your covers. And so having that, I would just recommend bringing it with you and just having it, okay? Next, what we did is some of the lashings you learn, like shear lashing is just lashing two poles together, basically. And I decided just to create a piece of cordage, just a hank like this, roughly six, seven, eight feet or so for shear lashings for bipods. And that was enough right there. And I could just put it in my pocket, have some cordage on me for other purposes as well. Then I had just this uh, 550 cord in my back pocket I forgot about that was just in there that I could use for other purposes, uh, like creating a toggle at the end to put inside my canteen and lift up off the fire, things of that nature. So while we have the bank line, we have the natural cordage, highly recommend bringing some 550 already in a quick release format and then having a couple different uh, lashings and materials in your pockets for uh, the purposes of lashing and camp craft ready to go. Containers, canteen cup, and uh, nesting cup, no issues there. Had a good time with that. We made char in this stuff, obviously boiled water and all that good stuff. For the bush pot, now the bush pot, I like this bush pot because I have 
the handholds on the side. One other thing I really liked about this is that I'm the only person that brought this bush pot or a different bush pot to the actual course. Everybody else had the Pathfinder bush pot there. So when it came time to find your pot and pack your pot away, guys were trying to find lids and trying to find their own pots and guessing which ones were theirs. But I had this guy that stood out because he was different and I was able to find my pot and my unique lid for my pot very easily. Now we used, we used the bush pot for boiling water and then for cooking. Halfway through the course, we were given raccoons. And raccoons we skinned, we quartered, cleaned and everything, and then cooked in our bush pots and then over the fire for the only meal that we had during the entire course. So there was no food other than those raccoons that we got, I think, on the evening of day two or so. So that was the uh, only food we got during the course, and we used our bush pots to cook that. Everything else we did, the majority of tasks in our canteen and cup, but we used our bush pot to cook and then boil a lot of water and eat out of. Those are the container and cordage items that I took in the course. All right, so let's talk about the remainder of the items that I took with me to the course. Now, I've got my little hygiene kit, toothbrush, toothpaste, floss, and then some lip balm. They let me keep the lip balm even though it's Vaseline, but I had that lip balm just to keep the uh, lips supple. You always know a steely-eyed killer by the uh, suppleness of his lips, okay? And then I have my headlamp. It's got my black diamond 400 right here with spare batteries. I've got my MC2 Sunto right here and that worked really well for all lane navigation exercises and then a 16 penny nail which is three and a half inch nail got my pencils and then my notebook paper i highly recommend having notebook paper that is uh you're able to form a grid because you're going to be doing a lot of map creating in here and so you'll be drawing maps so i highly recommend having a uh, grid uh, the notebook paper right in the rain that is capable of forming grids and then using pencils I wouldn't go anything other than pencils for the course but I had no issues with any of these items all right so laid out before you are all the tools and different implements that we had to create as part of the course that we were required to carry with us and that were inspectable at the end of the course now the first one I want to discuss was one that was given to us and that is just your solar compass right here. This is what we used for navigation using the sun. All it is, it has a square component on bottom divided up into 24 hours within a circle. And then we had the compass face on top, the nail sticking out as the gnomon. And we used the shadow created by the sun with the gnomon to actually navigate. I'll do more on that later. But that was given to us and we had it. I was just lucky enough to be carrying it the entire time, so I brought it home. We're allowed to keep it at the end of the course. Now the tools we had to recreate off the landscape, the first one is gonna be a mallet. Now this mallet has seen better days. Uh, definitely, but this was a section of pine uh, along with uh, some sections of pine that uh, I got from my buck saw. As part of our first exercise during our first land navigation exercises, we're required to go out and bring back certain lengths and uh, widths of material, and then they'll tell you what material to get. You need to bring that back. And so we created this mallet. The mallet was the first thing you're supposed to create, and then you can create everything else after you have the mallet. So I took my buck saw blade, wrapped my shimaga around the blade because they didn't have the buck saw frame yet, cut in, around the mallet here to create a shelf and then just baton away what would be become my handle. And so I'd have this mallet to hammer on the back of my uh, ax or my knife to baton through pieces of wood. With that mallet, we were able to cut off small sections uh, from the batoning with our knife to create wedges. Wedges were another tool that we had to create and bring with us. Then we can move to our buck saw. As you can see, I've just got three different pieces of pine that were green at the time and are starting to dry out a little bit with two uprights, roughly the same size, and then a cross section with square notches in the uprights along with a cross section to fit snugly. 550 cord around top with my windlass and then my blade in the bottom.
we whipped around the bottom portion of the bucksaw blade on both uprights before batoning in with our knife to create the slit where our bucksaw blade would sit and then we pounded in our bucksaw blade put in our little pins at the end and then tightened everything together and put it together to create our bucksaw blade and it was actually very easy to put this together given some of the instruction that the uh, uh, the school put out with different notches as opposed to creating V notches or any other type of notches square notches worked really really well and then we were able to manufacture this relatively quickly and then from there we could go on to create the remainder of our tools we had to create six toggles and then a number of stakes we ended up using a lot of stakes so we recreated stakes constantly this is the uh, bow and then the bearing block along with the catch from my bow drill now when you get there you're going to make a bow drill i think day two or so and you keep that set that you have unless you get a number and then that set that you create goes right in the fire but I was able to create a bow drill set from dead white pine which all the instructors thought would never work and then I was able to create that ember blow it into flame and I passed the bow drill first time too easy but they let you keep the bow and the bearing block and your catch as part of your kit lastly we had our pack frame that we made ladder style pack frame with square lashings the pack frame is made from green straighter material this has a little bit of bend on it but you only have so much time to gather material come back and then create that tool or that deliverable that they want from you and so here's our pack frame and we used it the last day the last day you were not allowed backpacks and we had to use our pack frame to carry everything uh, that was in our backpacks and move out our on our land navigation exercises so typically on the land navigation exercises you're going out to get materials to create all this and then to create your shelters the last exercise we did was uh, pretty brutal you had to go out and get a lot of material and I think my partner and I ended up carrying back uh, probably 150 200 pounds of materials to include all our gear back with us to camp to create our shelter at the end of that exercise you had to create a flint and steel fire with materials that you had uh, to gather during that land navigation exercise so very difficult process uh, very difficult last exercise but well worth it so these are the items that we created that we had to carry with us at all times to get other items and more materials to manufacture shelters and start fires as part of the course all right guys, so I've laid out some of the gear. You guys have seen uh, what I took to the course, talked about the uh, wooden tools that are over my shoulder really quick. Let's stop right here and let's talk about five tips from me for you guys to be successful at the course. Now the first tip, just like with anything in life, is mental preparation and mental focus. You guys need to be mentally ready to go to this course. I didn't drive halfway across the country to go to a course to be treated like I was at some resort. I went because I wanted to learn something and I wanted to challenge myself. And I was mentally ready to go there. I knew I was gonna get wet. I knew I was gonna be tired and hungry and cold. I knew it was gonna be rough. I knew certain things were gonna be asked of me with the tasks or with the challenges and obstacles in the course, and I understood that. Fortunately, being in the military and have, had, and have had the advantages that that entails, I'm used to a lot of that stuff. I'm used to the rigors of tough training. Some people were not. We had, I think, five, four or five people quit the course, which is probably a right around about average for that course, but they quit because they couldn't handle the rigors of the course. They were out of their element. So tip one, be mentally prepared. Do the things you need to before going to the course to be mentally prepared and focused. Tip number two, physical preparation. You need to be physically fit as best as you can before you go to the course. You need to be physically fit. So understand, read in the description of the course on the website, read 
what is in that course and understand you're going to be moving over rough terrain through thick terrain, a lot of vegetation. You're going to be cold, tired, wet, and hungry. You need to be physically fit. That physical fitness set short goals for yourself, short-term goals, before you reach that long-term goal. If you're not good at ruck marching or you're not good at carrying weight on your shoulders and moving through vegetation, start now. Use progressive steps they get to longer distances at faster times with heavier weight. And then continue to practice and train all the way up until you get to the course and you're ready to go into the training. You need to be physically fit. You need to be physically fit. All right. And physically fit will help you with your mental fitness. All right. Like Dick Winters said from Easy Company. 101st Airborne during World War II, physical fitness is the root of mental toughness. Tip number three, land navigation. You need to understand the basics of land navigation. You need to understand how to orient a map. You need to understand how to read a map. You need to understand how to plot a course. You need to understand how a protractor works, how a compass works. You need to understand all those things before you go to the scout class. If you go to the basic class, you'll probably learn a lot of that stuff and learn some basic land navigation skills, but you need to understand land navigation. So start studying up on land navigation, start studying the basics of land navigation, and prepare for advanced levels of land navigation, like using the solar compass at the scout class, because you're going to do it. And then you're going to do uh, Paul maps, you're going to make your own maps the same way. So you need to understand basic land navigation skills before you go there because you're going to see some advanced skills and you're going to have very little time to learn those skills and then execute those skills on a land navigation course. So you need to understand the basics of land navigation. Tip number four, master the basics. A lot of the guys that went to the course were at the basics class so they have some of the knowledge that goes into the scout class or intermediate class that will feed into the advanced class. The guy that was my partner in the course did not go to the basics class, so I had to teach him the things that were in the basics class. And luckily enough, he was able to absorb that information and then execute it. And then he helped out our team and was able to patch right alongside me. But master the basics. Know the basics before you get there. And then I'm guessing, now that I'm done with the scout course, that I need to master these basics that I learned in the scout course, master all those techniques and all those things that we did in the scout course before I even get to the advanced course so I can be that much more prepared. But master the basics is tip number four. All right, guys, the last tip I'm going to give you, tip number five, is move with a sense of purpose. Move with a sense of purpose, okay? Now, at the end of the course, everybody was tired, hungry, wet, cold, and you know, exhausted. Got it. We're kind, of, we're kind of moving slow. Got it. You need to move with a sense of purpose in everything you do in life. You know, I motivated my partner to move with me and he moved with me like a trooper and kept up the entire time during the course. I had to teach him a few things and he taught me a couple of things, but we motivated each other. Some guys out there were just moving slow and started to feel sorry for themselves. You need to move with a sense of purpose at this course. You need to move with a sense of purpose at anything you do in life. All right, if you don't move with a sense of purpose and you don't exercise that initiative and that discipline, that level of internal discipline to actually accomplish something and move yourself, you're not going to last very long, especially in a survival scenario where you may not have all these tools here. You may not have all the packing list items and you have to move with a sense of purpose to recreate a lot of that stuff or recreate something else from the landscape. But you have to move with a sense of purpose. Exercise that as much as you can at the course and anything you do in life, especially at the scout course, exercise that as much as possible because you're only training yourself to move with a higher level of discipline than you normally do. And it's a perfect time to exercise that. It will pay off. It will pay off in the end. Especially if you move with a sense of purpose and you realize you forgot something and now you have this extra time to recreate it. You know what I mean? But move with a sense of purpose, guys. Okay?
right guys, that does it for this video. If there's a burning question you guys have, leave it in the comments section and I'll try to answer it as fast as I can. Now, this is a very down and dirty video about the, course, the scout course at the Pathfinder School in Ohio. I want to get all the information to you guys based on the packing list and some of the deliverables you're going to have as fast as I can while it's still fresh in my mind. But if you guys like this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave a comment in the comment section. Make sure you ring that bell in the corner so you guys never miss out on my videos. I want to thank you guys for everything you do for me and for the channel, for all your likes, your views, your subscriptions, your comments, your feedback, and your shares. And I'll be back with another awesome video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.